Welcome, everybody. I'm glad that you're joining us. We are tonight studying Parable 4, The Horses of Shiloh, from Ted Parables from Denver Snuffer. I'd like to uh, welcome Brent Edward, who's going to be leading the discussion. Hey, Brent. Uh, before oh, we get started, yeah. before we get started, I wanted to extend uh, a real sincere thank you for preparing this and, and uh, offering to lead the discussion. Been uh, thinking of you and praying for you all week and really looking forward to this. And with that, turn it over to you and let's take it away. Thank you. That's, that's a good thing you did that because we're going to need all the help we can get. Um, so we're going to try something a little different than the past three weeks, if that's okay, and see where this goes. We have a fairly small group, well, 20 or so as it stands right now, but um, I'd like to start by sharing uh, some ideas, um, kind of put us down a path, and then I'll start with some uh, direct questions to folks, and then we'll see where the discussion goes from there. So it's parable four, the horses of Shiloh. Uh, the parables are numbered specifically and for a purpose. Uh, I'm not going to get into that tonight. Um, I think we've thought about and discussed the parables as an endowment um, knowledge. And I want to start off with a statement that Denver made on August 3rd, 2010. Ten parables is, in my view, perhaps as important as anything I have written. You can say things indirectly in a parable that cannot be said directly. If that book is understood by the reader, they will have a wealth of information about the gospel. So to that end, um, generally I think it's best to keep the door open to meaning in the parables, but tonight I'd like to focus on what I believe is the main point, at least let's start there, or the big idea that's being communicated in this particular parable. Obviously, there are layers, there are other items to be discussed, and that should be undertaken apart from this conversation. And, and if we end up there in the end, that's fine. And Brent? Um, yes, sir. It's not that Denver is being coy. He is following exactly the pattern of the master. He is indeed. This is how it's done. Appreciate that comment, Kevin. So... <clears throat> I'm going to jump right in and let's talk about axis. And I, I think you'll see where I'm going with this in a few minutes. Um, there's a lot of historical background given about access in the, the early part of the parable. He was named so because of his warlike appearance acquired in battles with other horses. It was hard for any man to ride. Many feared to approach him. Some thought him never truly tamed for fear of him. Uh, here, for fear of him, he won his races because other horses wouldn't or would cower at his presence. He won every test. He could run faster, jump higher, pull more than any in the field against him, and he did so throughout his life. I think it's fairly uh, apparent that Axis represents the Lord, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And it's interesting that those details were were had at one point in the kingdom. And then we get to a point later where the rulers want to create a monument, right? They seem to have no knowledge and they have a, uh, there's a legend or there's a, there's a discussion had that one man knew the details and knew the perfections and the attributes of Axis, and they find him, and he's now an elderly man. But in his youth, he knew who Axis was, and so he was summoned to give the details. Um, but at this point, it's interesting that the facts are gone, ironed out of life, the history forgotten, and yet there was a history with some accuracy the detailed axis, but no one had preserved it or at least bothered to read it. Um, it was now legends and fairy tales, incomplete, made up ideas that now occupied the minds of both the leaders and the people alike. And worse, there was no correct concept of axis at all. Um, 
I think the elderly man at least alludes to a, a Joseph Smith type character. It could be many others, I suppose. But the old man gave accurate, an accurate account of Axis and Axis characteristics, attributes, and whatnot to the sculptors. Uh, we read further that it's obvious that truth was not wanted or desired by the leaders uh, when they saw the first efforts of the sculptors based on the old man's accounting of who Axis was. So the false ideas, the traditions, or something conjured up in the minds of the people or the minds of man seem to appeal more to us than the truth. In fact, this world hates the truth. Uh, the true model for the strong male horse scarred from battle was replaced by a mare, ostensibly more slight in build without scars and other unsightly attributes. I think this is a cautionary tale of historic Christianity and a, and a cautionary tale for all of us because we have inherited traditions, ideas, um, even a picture of who Christ our Lord and Savior is that comes out of historic Christianity. And it is um, incomplete, it is wrong, and um, well, it's not the Christ who is scarred in battle, larger, and his body bearing marks, whose strength of body may well show through when we see him. He's been replaced by a happy-go-lucky chap, effeminate and soft. Uh, whether it's in Renaissance art or just the tradition of historic Christianity, we have, a, we have a really bad idea of who Christ is. And as such, it is not possible to have faith, according to Joseph Smith, because we do not know what his characteristics, perfections, and attributes are. As he stated in the lectures on faith, let us here observe that three things are necessary in order that any rational and intelligent being may exercise faith in God unto life and salvation, which is what we're after, right? First, the idea that he actually exists, and secondly, a correct idea of his character, perfections, and attributes. Uh, a wise man on November 8th, 2011, stated, when someone cries out that we're in desperate need of repentance today, however they are called, however, they are called negative and unkind and not at all like Christ. They imagine Christ as a limp-wristed, happy-go-lucky chap who is indulgent and promiscuously forgiving. I do not imagine such a being, but instead a counselor of righteousness, whose every word is designed to make me become more like him, whose every sacrifice was designed to bring greater light into my mind and heart, who stretches and pulls me relentlessly forward and upward, bringing me to my knees as I view in horror my many failings. I see a man of holiness, who cannot tolerate any degree of unrighteousness, but who is ever ready to heal and instruct, a God indeed, who works to bring others to become like him. So that's kind of phase one that I wanted to talk about. And then let's discuss phase two, because I think we have all dealt with, we all come out of traditions where we had notions, ideas, um, thoughts about what will be and how it will be and how it will unfold and so on and so forth. And I'd like to switch the discussion to that of a, a teacher or in other words, a prophet. So from this different perspective, um, what are our notions of a prophet? At least those of us that come out of an LDS background um, it suits, dress sharp, never had an argument with their wives, never raised their voice to their children, exhibits no imperfections in public, would never swear or tell off-color jokes, and I think the list could, could go on and be long indeed. But consider these statements. From Lecture 6 in Grand Junction, 
Love can be feigned by the presiding authorities, but women generally have a difficult time pulling that kind of nonsense off. Men can pretend to many things. I saw Bill Clinton at a funeral, laughing and carrying on until he saw the camera, and then he was right back to grieving. Oh, I feel so bad. I think he feigned so well. That's why women like, it. women like him. I care. I care a lot. Is that a D cup? Well, we'll have to edit this. The next statement was made on April 26, 2012. If you want to search for men seeking to rival the brethren, take a look at CES. For example, one of my former bishops is able to fill a stake center to overflowing midday with Mormon housewives who dote on the man. I can assure you I have no intention of trying to accomplish anything similar. I know that what I've written is deeply offensive to many, many church members. It has no advantage apart from being honest, and the honesty of the material is accomplished by my sincere belief in it also being true. If it is wrong, then grow a pair and openly confront the ideas. Tell us your name, give us your basis for contradicting the material, and act like you are confident in your beliefs. Or keep your skirts on and snipe from the sidelines, but never expect me to respect the frail and insecure who are unable or unwilling to compete in the arena where the valiant are found suffering for the Lord's cause. So, with those ideas in mind, <clears throat> each of us is on a journey to connect with our Savior, which I think is really what this, this parable is trying to teach us, is that we need to understand, just as Joseph said, God's uh, characteristics, perfections, and attributes. And we need not to just know of him, but we want to know him personally. So, I have some questions. Gary Gibson, is he still on board? Oh, tell me, is there... Yes, I am. All right. Well, Gary Gibson, <laughs> I've got a question for you. I have you a question up... for you after your question. Okay. He's there among the lights. <laughs> <laughs> the blinding light. Okay. So we're all seeking to know this Savior, and we're coming to know him differently from the one that we were taught about growing up. Gary, you were raised Catholic you had certain notions, you converted to Mormonism, took on new notions, and now you find yourself here. And I'm wondering if you can give us some insights into really what this, this parable I think is driving at, is that we have these traditions, we have these ideas of a God with certain characteristics, and a lot of it's wrong. And I'm wondering if you might be able to share some ideas with us as to what you've learned in your journey. Well, the second time this rodeo came around, I recognized it. <laughs> That's okay. And, and, I, and I would be lying if I didn't admit I had a little bit of chuckle as everyone else suffered through the rejection uh, this second time around. <laughs> uh, I shouldn't say that, but um, I would say what's amazing is I'm reading through the Book of Mormon now is how many words, how many times Christ is quoted his words are all over the place and it's by his words that we can tell for example like when he's with the 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 people of limhi with when king noah and he sends abinadi to prophesy all the evil concerning them how intimately he was involved with every aspect that happened to them mm -hmm. so i mean i think he's put behind the scenes pulling levers that we have no clue about in all sorts of different directions. But I, but his words, if we study him and concentrate and focus, we can, um, I've been surprised at how I missed that before, but how, how many times, now that I'm focused on how many times he actually is quoted, and I think it's by his words that we, we know him. Interesting, I appreciate that. Um, Jimmy Townsend. <laughs> you have a similar background and a similar similar journey that Gary made. I'm interested in your insights with regard to notions that had to be let go of and, and how you find yourself here. Yeah, I mean, for me, I mean, I was only 16 at the time. Um, 
you know, what, what drew me to originally to Mormonism, I would say, is that, is that, that Catholicism, you actually don't learn much about God. You know, the, 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 the nature of your, your, your worship is largely, you know, you go once a week, um, on Sundays and, and, you know, if, if you go for one hour a week on Sundays, you're, you're a full Catholic, you know, and the nature of their, uh, their worship services are, are more symbolic. There's probably more singing involved. There's more ritual, I would say, than there is, uh, you know, actual theological content behind it. Um, at, at, le at least that was my experience. And so, you know, for me, what attracted me to Mormonism is that there was, was that there was uh, so much more available about God, about the afterlife, about, you know, what God's even trying to do today. You know, does God even do anything today? Um, you know, to, to me, you know, Catholicism really, you know, was, was an extremely repetitive um, religion, um, you know, where, where really progressing in life, uh, you know, that, that was not a focus. Was it easy to let go of? Or was there, were there things that you were challenged to let go of? Or maybe still are? Oh, no, for, for me, I was young enough at the time. I, I was okay. not deeply entrenched. Okay. Jimmy, when you were in that Catholic space, did you think of the Pope as a prophet? Somebody who literally talked to God and got a insight and information. I, I couldn't have told you anything other than his name. It, it's a totally different paradigm. You know, there's, a, there's somebody that's the Pope that's up and... <laughs> Uh, you know, that lives in Rome, uh, but that's about it. Uh, okay. It, it, it's a very, very different model than than the LDS one. I mean, and even like the bishops, you know, like I could probably say the name of the bishop at the time because like he gets named, but I couldn't tell you anything about him, anything that he taught, what he looks like. Not a thing. Never heard him speak, never heard a word from him. Same with the Pope. I couldn't give you a single quote from any any Pope. There's no general conferences or anything like that. And for a Catholic, the Bible is more like a, a relic. The actual idea that one would open it up and read it is just almost unheard of. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. Brian Bowler, do you have any insights? You grew up LDS. What have you had to, what have you been challenged by or? had to deal with in terms of maybe incorrect notions and ideas? Um, <laughs> I think one of the biggest struggles um, that I had was his, uh, as I got to know the Savior's voice, it was a lot more complex than I thought. The, the, uh, he was a lot more humorous, sometimes he has a character, you know, I mean, that's what came through in, in my dealings with him was uh, he's very straightforward sometimes. And sometimes anyway, it's just the breadth of his character was so much different than what I was taught. Um, sure. And I, and I realized part of, as I read about his character is like, sometimes if we grow, you know, to be like him, I, I think some of those things can be said of those of us who try to be like him sometimes. You know, I know in the church, people would say that many of us in this group were unruly and sure. never quite tamed, you know. and Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, so, <laughs> I mean, I think, uh, anyway, those are, sorry, I've been. <laughs> no, you're fine. I was actually okay. freaking out while I was listening. So <laughs> You're fine. <laughs> so. Thank you. I appreciate it. McKay, right. Thank you. do you have any insights, anything you want to share? Oh, I think, uh, I think a lot of us have uh, come to understand 
God a great deal differently as we've gotten to hear Denver's message. I guess in my own case, um, the things God cares about and the things he doesn't care about have shifted a bit in my head. You know, I thought it made a great deal of difference whether I drank alcohol. Apparently, it doesn't. I still don't drink alcohol. I can't convert. <laughs> um, I thought, I, I would have thought that, uh, you know, trash talk was uh, not a godly thing, but then I really kind of missed Matthew 13, is it, where God's talking trash to the Pharisees? Yep. He just didn't use our trash talk, so I didn't recognize it. Right. I mean, um, I've, I've certainly known people that that were once aboard and, and a part of things that have been put off by various things, whether it's jokes about small genitals, large breasts, or some other item that offended, right? Was very yeah. off-putting. His... Uh, his uh, complete willingness to forgive yeah. uh, it, it has surprised me a bit. I mean, these are things I've learned from Denver. Um, the idea that uh, loyalty and obedience are so high on the list of uh, priorities is, uh, was a surprise. I mean, I could go on and on, but there's just a lot of the the God that I've come to understand by hearing uh, Denver talk about the Lord is a different kind of God than I had imagined through my um, Mormon religion. I can relate to that. Brent? Yes, Karen. Um, my concept of my Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ hasn't changed. Things around me and my perception has changed as far as understanding the teachings of men have suppressed me instead of helping me grow stronger. And my journey started, I guess now about seven, eight years ago now, with the prayer that I wanted a stronger relationship with my Savior. And I wanted that. And things just started flooding in, and information started flooding in, and the contradictions, um, seeing if we were such a great people, why aren't we? Why is it Salt Lake Zion? I mean, why mm -hmm. isn't you know, why no longer are the teachings of Joseph Smith any good? Why aren't? And then I was directed to another church to attend it and realizing there was a group of people that had more faith than I've ever seen in a group of people that believed in healing, believed in using, and still pray, prayed more for each other, um, didn't didn't say you know the miracles of healing, and I'm not saying in a it's not wasn't in a boastful way. It wasn't in oh hallelujah type thing. It was a very quiet manifestation of healing in the spirit in this group of people that I've met, mm -hmm. and. The pastor that runs this non-denominational church, he left the Methodist church for the same reason that this artist had to redo the way Axis was. He had to be mainstreamed and acceptable to everybody. Mm -hmm. And you, in Christ, not everybody's going to accept him. Nobody, not everybody wants him in their lives. Right. And for me, all of this knowledge that I've gained has just given me that much more stronger. It reinforced my faith. 
and, and what can be accomplished if we have faith. Um, a lot of things that I knew all through sitting through church meetings and stuff and disagreeing with things that were being said. And I'm sitting there going, that doesn't sound right. Or, and I would, I guess I was the misfit. And I would sit there and say, no, that's not right. But everybody was shaking their head. And I'm just going, and now I'm vindicated in how I felt then and realizing why. And there is a, there is so much more to, to grasp and hold in your hand and take to heart. And God is more loving than ever in my life. And like Denver said, accept those gifts. I realize more of the gifts that he has to give now than I did 20 years ago. And, you know, and I'm, I'm realizing what Denver said. If you don't accept those gifts, you're, you're sinning. Um, you basically yeah. you, you're just saying, Oh, thank you for the gift. And then you toss it in the trash. Mm-hmm. And I don't do that anymore. I don't, I cherish everything that I have gained and it has, and I, my prayer has been answered. Good. I, that's beautiful. You know? And so it's like in the parable, it's not my, it's all the trappings around us and that people, their perceptions and, um, you know, I can understand where we, where we become of one heart and one mind and we can perceive together a goal and that we have of the gathering. Mm-hmm. And I could see where we need that, that oneness in Christ to, so that we all have that in our hearts. Not that we're ever going to be the same. And we'll always view something different, but at least we know who the Savior is, and we can all agree on that. Amen. Hey, Jill Van Heron, you came to this through an interesting route. I'm interested in your perspectives. Before your battery runs out. No, we're here. Hi. You're unmuted. Okay, thanks. I guess one of your... I guess two things come to mind about about like preconceived notions that have been corrected. Is that where what I'm sure. understanding? Sure. Okay. So for me, um, people who believed in God were in this little box over here, and I mean it was a choice that they made to choose to believe. Um, and that if God was real, then God is this far away, strict authority figure that I really didn't want to have anything to do with forever. And so God was so much outside of me so far away that um, there was no relevance to having God in my life. I can do everything on my own. Until I couldn't. And then, you know, at that time, when there's just that teeny, tiny little grain of hope that if there is such a thing as this God that people talk about, I need that God now. <laughs> um, and, and to have had the experience that I did have, that was mind-blowing for me because it shattered away that God is some far away God because God was in that room right hearing my voice hearing my cries and pleading with me so then I guess I understand it now as the the concept of non-dualism right God is is outside of me but God is also inside of me and I didn't understand that at the time um and then secondly, as I, then once I did believe that a God existed, that knew who I was and could actually hear me when I cried out for help, then the second thing that I had to, to 
shatter is this idea that so now all of those people that I had judged as being religious well okay so they've got it right and I had it wrong and I can accept that so I just need to find out which one of them is more right and so if I can just figure out if I'm supposed to be Catholic or figure out if I'm supposed to be a Jew or figure out if I'm supposed to be a Messianic Jew or figure out if I'm supposed to be a mainstream Christian or <laughs> Presbyterian or Baptist like how am I supposed to figure that out and so then I just kind of poked into all of them and I was just waiting to be told which one because now that I know that one exists surely there's a correct path right and it's which organization on earth has the truth and so then I needed to find out which one had the truth. And if I could just find out which one had the truth, then I would follow that perfectly to a T. I would be the best at whatever religion that was. And so the, the, the mind blowing concept for me, because I spent a really long time trying to figure out who was the right church. And I understood that I was supposed to be in the Mormon church and I was waiting around trying to figure out what happened. But I think for me, the, the big second mind blow for me was that um i got no answers on where i was supposed to go because i wasn't supposed to commit to an organization and follow their earthly boxes to a t because that's how i was going to serve god and i really honestly thought that that's what you do because i mean that's what the people in churches do you know they pick a church they go and they do it 100 percent or less than 100 percent um and that's what I was going for. It wasn't until, you know, Denver comes along and, and maybe opens up my mind a little bit further to say that he doesn't want me to be obedient to an organization and follow their boxes. He wants my heart. And I didn't realize that those, those people who were in those churches that I had separated from myself, it, I never saw them as doing anything but picking an organization organization and checking boxes so then now I'm like wow all of those people who are in all of those churches really truly love God and that's how they're serving God that's how they have a relationship with God and so those were the two that were that were huge for me that okay. you know to be so separate from religious people and just to perceive them so differently and then realize well, they're all exactly the same. Like everyone's really trying to, to get closer to God in some way or another. Um, so, yeah. Thank you. Hey, Jared Sorensen, uh, we haven't met, but I think you're somewhat newer along this path, if I've heard you correctly in some of the previous meetings. I'm interested in knowing what maybe was maybe the, one of the more eye-opening things you've learned as you've read what, what Denver's taught. Is there anything that jumps out that really either challenged you or just kind of shifted your paradigm hard? No, I don't know how necessarily new. It's like probably a lot of different circumstances. Like I probably came in contact or was around 2012 and it was, <clears throat> I mean, at the moment, um, one of the things that I guess specific to this parable that it really brings to my mind, that was my, I guess, shattering view was basically opening up to, <clears throat> I, I guess I hadn't realized how narrowly I had probably viewed Christ before. Like some of the images that that parable gives specifically, I was like, I, presumed that many of the pictures and art that were around churches were probably a fairly accurate or, I mean, not, I never thought it was an exact, you know, kind of picture, but I was like, yeah, that's probably a fairly good representation or something like that. And then after, I don't know what I could put my finger on, but it was like that whole thing was completely shattered. Like I began thinking about suppose Christ, I, really had somehow intersected into my life but was like a homeless beggar like that looks nothing like those pictures I've, I've imagined christ to be this being 
that is really quite narrow that could be completely wrong and it was more opening up to i mean there's that aspect which i think is kind of a physical thing which i was like wow i didn't realize how much of an idol i think i had pictured in my own mind due to all these you know various conditioned things growing up so one it's like breaking down those kind of like physical idols and then two was probably really trying to appreciate his character what that that meant a whole lot more like a simple idea that it hadn't occurred to me before was like if like knowing christ meant you could pick him out of a, a lineup for example, like if there was a criminal lineup and a whole bunch of people lined up there and one of them was Jesus, could you pick him out? But then it was like, well, there were lots of people in Jerusalem who could probably have done that, but they thought he was a complete liar and a fraud. And just being able to even go that far to say, okay, I've got his physical characteristics more aligned with what he may have actually looked like, that still doesn't really tell me much about what kind of a being he really is like what because a lot of things are being said about him that our uh, people are warning against and saying you know this this guy is really no good he's a fraud for this and that and so it really made me question i guess a lot of ideas like just because something gets a label that is very off-putting doesn't necessarily mean that that's accurate or justified right. so for me it was just suddenly being shocked into having to open up to a lot of different ideas and notions that at one time probably would have offended me and being like i'm probably going to have to take some of these more seriously than i ever wished it was so much easier and simpler when i didn't have to do that sure <clears throat> sure thank you Tasha, do you have any insights or thoughts on things that have challenged you? Uh, sure. Um, McKay kind of touched on this, but the fact that Christ is quick to forgive. Um, you know, growing up in the church, you had to go through this long, grueling repentance process if right. you did something that they thought was grievous. Um, it was very refreshing to, to realize that the scriptures were right when they said that uh, immediately your sins can be forgiven. Mm -hmm. um, also, the, the idea of the prototype of the saved man, that what Christ became is something that each one of us must be, become in order to be saved. Um, but even after hearing that, that seventh lecture, on that topic it's only just recently dawned on me what it actually took for the lord to do what he did that every odd was stacked against him and that it was most likely that he would still fail um i guess growing up in the church i thought well of course the lord accomplished the atonement he was supposed to that's what he came here to do um, not even grasping what it actually took for him to succeed. So my, I guess my love, my appreciation for him has just grown so much in realizing how difficult a task that was and how unlikely it was for him to succeed. Yeah, um, no guarantees, right? Right. Uh, the paintings in the LDS church of this effeminate, uh, Jesus that we've been told looks more like Satan or Lucifer. Um, he is a lion and a lamb. I don't think we really understand the lion part of the Lord that is coming. And I think this parable really touches on mm -hmm. how Christ is the lion. Yeah. And that is what we are to look forward to. So we'd better be prepared. Sure. Just a few things. Sure. Adrian, as long as the mic's hot. <laughs> the Any thoughts? Biggest shock for me um, was the nature of Christ being a personal redeemer. Um, I started reading the Second Comforter, and I didn't I didn't look ahead. 
And the whole time I'm reading the book, the suspense is building because I'm noticing that this guy talks like he's actually seen the Lord. I mean, I know that that can't be true, but he, but he's talking like it. And man, he's making a lot of sense and some really good points. And, and the suspense is building and building. And probably the most shocking thing I've ever read uh, that Denver wrote was those 14 words. When I got to that point in the book, I remember exactly where and when and everything. I know he lives for I have seen him. He has ministered to me. Absolutely hit me like a lightning bolt. Mm -hmm. um, and that crushed all the notions about this Christ that is this unknowable sky God that perhaps talks to the president of the church, but would never talk to us normal rank and file people. And yeah, everything that I had thought about the Lord was absolutely blown up by that. That moment changed my life. Thank you. Brett Corbridge, you've been kicking around the turnip patch for a while. What are some of the things that you've encountered and learned, had to let go of? Hi, thanks for asking. Um, I was just so shocked how deep the fall is, you know, how complicated the climb back is. Uh, the life wasn't an enzyme story. You know, so many surprises. Uh, um, you know, God gave me a little phrase one time. He said, everything with me is different, deeper, and more. And so I try to ask, what's this? And I was constantly being surprised. And just for fun, um, here's a quick little example. My wife is very smart and very quiet. She's sitting right here. You'll never hear from her, see? And just a minute ago, she said, what if in this parable, uh, what if the sculptor is Christ? What if, um, of course it's Axis, but what if on another level, Mm -hmm. The sculptor is actually Christ. And so I thought that was a really fascinating way to read this parable. Indeed. Appreciate it. I see Marsha Hills on. Hey, Marsha, I don't see you, but I see a window. Oh, there you are. Any thoughts? Anything you want to share? Yeah. Um, I, you know, as you know, you know the exact day I was baptized into the yeah. LDS Church. But, um, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, I came in by way of, I had been a, basically a non-believer um, through my, my youthful years. And um, it wasn't until my senior year in high school that I, through a series of events, started to, uh, to read the Bible. And, um, and I will never forget my experience with the Sermon on the Mount. As I got into that, it was, it was as if I was seeing him there teaching these people. And it, it was so real to me that I have never doubted from that day till this whether he exists or not. And so I came in. Shortly thereafter, I was exposed to the Book of Mormon. The voices to me were similar, so I had no problems with the Book of Mormon, and basically I came into the church that way. And um, I came in with the assumption, especially having read the Book of Mormon, that Latter-day Saints had that same close relationship with the Savior. And... Um, I know I taught Relief Society Spiritual Living for years, and I just remember I would look at the faces of these sisters sometimes, and they would just look at me like I was from outer space, <laughs> because um, there was just a connection that hadn't been made there for many of them, not all of them, but for many of them. And so, and I came in, I, I was a McConkie, like some others, and, you know, uh, Bruce R. had talked extensively about that that was a possibility for us to meet with the Savior and to see him. And I assumed he had, you know, because why else would he have said some of the things he said? So when I ran into Denver's book in 2007, 
and read through it like Adrian said, you know, it was like, this guy speaks as one having authority. And I was like, what gives him the right? <laughs> and I missed that phrase at the end of the, uh, the book um, until my second reading through it because I was reading through it quickly. And, and then it was like, yeah, oh, that's it, you know. And so um, it's like, okay, I guess we're returning to Bruce R. here. <laughs> but, um, yeah, it was a... A return to something, and it's true that Latter-day Saints, for the most part, have this very formal relationship with the Savior that was weird to me, and I never quite understood um, how that, why that existed or whatever. But with Denver, it was like, oh, yeah, he's done it. It's, it's doable. It can happen. So that was my experience. Interesting. Thanks for sharing. Um... Hey Brent, you mind if I share um, Two other things I, I thought of of Christ was uh, I love the image of the rearing, you know, the power there because there's so much power and strength. And you were talking, somebody said earlier about the loyalty mm -hmm. that he values and obedience. Um, what I've come to understand is like sometimes I. I see my own weakness, but I, I, my trust is not in my own arm, but in his arm and his, his power and his loyalty. And I mean, he's, he doesn't give up. He's such a, he, he has that power that, that scares others because he's, he's a, just has an engine that goes, you know, and it's to me, you know, and that's like, cause I've argued with him by so many times and like, why do you keep, trying you know why with me or with other why you know i'm i'm like what the fetch is the matter with you you know and um but uh, anyway so that that really struck me and the other thought i had was the messengers that i've had in my life haven't always fit into the prophet you know soft-spoken manner sometimes i've had messengers come to me uh that i knew uh one of them i, I met in the it was an AA guy that was just really powerful. He'd been, uh, he was a speaker in, in the recovery program I was in and he came in and um, I'd been there for a week or so and it, my whole faith had been shattered about how to overcome anything. And, and, and this guy was, was so different, but he had that same power and I could recognize the a authority uh, kind of thing like others have said is like there's something about w when you know him too there's a little bit of authority that comes across or uh, both with him and then in his messengers are there's something extra you know um anyway so i i'm just i'm just touched at that those things the power and, and then the unorthodoxness of sometimes the messengers they and learning that it's it's not always soft spoken and you know hey brother it's sometimes it's it comes in swear words the, the smack you need on the side of the head and right or just in like or, or humor too of like duh what's the matter with you you know um right you know it, it's just so much more again personality <laughs> depth there that mm -hmm. then we were at the battle and and finally the what other thing i had written, wrote down there was the scars so if we be li if we become like him, our lives may be scarred. Lord. We're going to bear uh, battles within us that we've went through, and and often for us probably lost sometimes. But coming through it with him, we're going to bear some. You know, some. Um, we're not going to be our lives won't be ones that people always will look at like <laughs> and say, "I want to be like that guy," you know, or that <laughs> that woman. You know, it's like that's not what we're, we're not going to be if we on his team, it doesn't always look attractive to the rest of the world. Anyway, right, sorry. part that. of the expectation here that we'll come back battered and bruised. And if we don't, we've missed a large measure of what this was meant to uh, be for us. Jerry Ann, you're reading, you've got, you've got something to say. <laughs> well, I just wanted to say, I, <laughs> It, this was a, a kind of an amazing thing because I've been reading several books on the on the whole piece and 
some of their beliefs about the Massah. And in one, one of the books, um, it talked about how um, when the Massah it came to the Hopi, like people were always asking him why, because the mask of the Massah is, is grotesque. It, it, looks, it looks hideous. And they asked the Hopi people, why? why? Why did you portray him like that? And they said it was because when the Massah came to them, they, he was beaten, he was battered, he was torn to pieces. He wasn't like a beautiful man. He came, he came bearing all of the wounds. And, you know, as Brian was saying, you know, in addiction recovery, one of my, one of my final straws with the church um, was I went to a addiction recovery meeting and um, they sat in that meeting and they, they told us, they says, if you're, if you're working with people in this program, don't, don't share your scars. Don't tell your stories about your healing process. Don't, don't share those things because that just confuses people and, and they wonder why they can't heal. To me, that was always like the most beautiful part of the recovery process is learning about other people's scars, learning about other people's wounds. So I just thought that was kind of really cool that I just read that previous to then reading this parable and, and going through it this week. So. Thanks for sharing that, Amanda. Cherry Ann. Um, this was, I think, my favorite parable. <clears throat> it probably shouldn't be because it's in the middle of the book, but um, <laughs> it's also in the middle of the book, almost, perhaps because axis, um, I looked up the meaning of the word axis, and every definition of it is center, central, um, there's a reason why the horse's name is Axis, but I did not realize being, being the perfect Mormon, being a return missionary, doing everything perfectly, having six children, which got me to the highest level of the celestial kingdom. I did not realize um, what a fictitious character we had created out of the Lord. I did not realize how completely neglected and um, ignored was the Lord. And um, we had been worshiping and had created this false idol or this fictitious character um, through, you know, through time, I guess, through, <laughs> through my childhood, through my life. And reading this parable, I was struck by the fact that it took one, you know, the old man who died, one witness to be able to describe the Lord and uh, in, in all details. And Denver is that witness. And I view this um, parable as a, not only an invitation for us to rise up to um, seek to truly know him, but he he describes his his features and his character i when i he he says this horse was taller than for example than other horses denver has mentioned that the lord was taller than most men um of his time he i don't know where he said that but i believe that through this he's giving descriptions of the lord that he knows because he knows him personally and um, I'm grateful for the, um, <clears throat> excuse me, the example and the kick in the butt <laughs> per se to recognize that this fictitious character that we have grown up thinking we were worshiping doesn't exist. And uh, we need to, <clears throat> to take a step back and, and seek to find the real Christ which is what the Lectures on Faith is about as well. Yes, it is. Thanks. That's a really nice uh, segue, but first I'd like to ask Lori Larson to share some thoughts. Is she over there on the couch somewhere? <laughs> yes, we're here. Are we unmuted? Yep. yep. You're unmuted. Oh. Why is that turn up closer? So they can hear you. <laughs> Anyway, 
Um, I think I specifically told you you weren't supposed to call on me the same thing. Um, oh, well. <laughs> the thing that I, it's been interesting to me um, about this parable, the thing that I've been thinking about, um, is the fact that they, that the people decided they wanted something that looked like a mare. They wanted something softer and calmer and more effeminate. And um, it's interesting to me in my life, I feel like um, even being a woman, I feel like I have never necessarily been effeminate. Um, I have always kind of struggled with the fact that I feel like the world and the church always taught me that I needed to be softer and um, I guess more Christ-like in that sense. And that's just not what my nature is. I'm just not a very soft person. Um, I can be soft, um, but I um, have a tendency to be a little brash and to say things like they are and that's just kind of who I am. Um, so as I'm sitting here thinking about the fact that they wanted a mare and they wanted something soft and, and the world has kind of taught us that we need to be that way, um, it, it makes me think about um, the, our divine parents talk when, when Denver Berry specifically said, when he talked about the mother, the heavenly mother, and he said, you know, <laughs> if you're picturing this white haired old grandmotherly woman, um, you're going to be very disappointed because that's not who she is. She's very strong. In fact, of the two, she was probably the stronger of the two. And, um, you know, that, that gives me a little hope, maybe, that this picture that we have of godhood, whether it be Christ or the parents together, um, that, that's, that's probably not the picture that I've been striving my whole life to try and be this softer more gentle person that is just, I mean, those aren't bad things, but that it's just not in my nature necessarily to be that person. And that it's okay to be the person who is strong and determined and will, will say the hard things and um, call you on your crap and call you to repentance when it's time to be called to repentance. And you know, that that's, that that's not a bad thing that that is that can be a godly thing so those are my thoughts thank you i appreciate it <clears throat> has anybody been surprised by the reality that the man with the power speaking of denver to ask and receive who said he is confident in the ability to do so and to get an answer is so hesitant or so loath to uh to ask until he's exhausted all the resources, talk to friends, talk to his wife, and so on and so forth before taking it to the Lord. Um, McKay, any thoughts on that? And then Adrian, any thoughts after McKay's done? Yes. Um, that really is fascinating, isn't it? It is. It is just fascinating how how loath Denver is to go to the Lord. Um, I've been asking this question around, how are we going to find, how is Denver going to find out the location for Zion? And the first thought that may come to mind is, well, the Lord's going to tell him. He's just waiting on the Lord for the Lord to tell him. In fact, that's not how it's going to work. He's looking for it. He's seen it in vision and he's looking for it. He's out there checking out pieces of ground. Now, why? I mean, that, that really tells you quite a bit about the Lord and quite a bit about Denver, who understands the Lord better. Uh, it's just fascinating. Joseph seems to have been less... A reluctant to ask mm -hmm. somebody comes to joseph says hey i like right. a blessing sure let's let's see what the we'll get a revelation for you from the lord right and joseph got into some 
um, blind ending alleys as a result of uh, asking before mm -hmm. thinking it through. And fortunately, Denver's learned from those. Right. Um, on that point, I have been pleased that, um, well, I've noticed that Denver's quite willing to answer uh, uh, some questions. I've sent him a lot of questions that I got no response to. Yeah, me too. <laughs> and then others that I was sure I wouldn't get a response to that, that he, you know, he liked the question, I guess. And yeah. I asked him about the Nauvoo house and uh, what's the deal with the Nauvoo house? And the Lord commands the temple and then this hotel. What the hell is that all about? And uh, he, you know, he thought that was a question worth answering. But um, there was a point here that I think I'm, I've lost. Uh, oh, yes. I have noticed that more often than not, if I have a question for Denver, if I will just say, wait a second, so let's just give the Lord a shot on this, see if the Lord will tell me. I will ask it, an impossibly difficult question. There's no way the Lord could answer this question short of sending an angel. And within a day, I've got my answer. It doesn't always happen that way. But the Lord is very willing to answer questions too, even questions you can't imagine that he could answer. Um, and, uh, uh, that seems like a very discursive answer. I think I'll turn off my microphone. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Any thoughts, Adrian? Yeah. Just as soon as McKay tells us about the Nauvoo house. <laughs> <laughs> Finish what you're saying. Okay. The Nauvoo house is kind of. You always have to have an Abu house with a temple because people need a place to stay when they come from India to get their knowledge, their, their endowment, and then they'll be going back to India. I'm making that up, but people will come from far away and they have to have a place to stay. And so the, DNC 124 talks about people in the Nauvoo house um, contemplating the glories of Zion. And it just seemed to me like there was more going on there than just a hotel. And that's indeed what it is. It's a, it's a caravansary for people coming from far away who need to do temple work for themselves um anyway that that's what i learned cool thanks uh so just one thought brent the the idea of hesitancy to go to the lord i think it's possible in fact likely that the biggest encumbrance we have to getting answers is that we're asking the wrong question as an illustration, consider the sculptor in the horses of Shiloh. And what if he had prayed after he had uh, disappointed the princes and decided that he would go pray and, and pray about, Lord, how do I make this statue more beautiful? How do I make it less ugly and less repulsive? Uh, what form would the hindquarters take to be attractive to women and children? Is he going to get answers? He's asking all the wrong questions. And I tell you, 90% of the time, that's me. I'm praying about the horse's ass and asking completely the wrong question. When I And then I'm, I, I'm frustrated and I don't get an answer. And when I ask the right question, I'm amazed at the brilliance of what the Lord can share. So it seems to me that at least part of Denver's hesitation is to make sure that he's asking not amiss. Uh, and like McKay said, exhaust every other um, possibility and think through and 
talk and labor to work it out rather than taking no thought save it was to ask me. Because when you take no thought save it is to ask, at least in my experience, that's 90% of the time, it's because I'm asking the wrong question. Good point. I'm well exercised in asking the wrong questions myself. Um, so I've got one more question. Uh, this came by way of, of a friend who's, who's on here, but Jesus is a trier of men testing them. Each one of us. I thought he already knew everything about us. So why are we, why are we being tried if he knows everything about us? Anybody have any thoughts? Because we don't know everything about us. And that's the way we learn what our strengths are, what our weaknesses are. You know, Denver talks about <clears throat> how we have to come here to be tested. And usually that test is to failure. And uh, I mean, I think of Peter, you know, he had to fail not just once, but multiple times for him uh, to finally succeed. Out of that failure came the fire, came, came the, the, he was reborn in the spirit that he needed to be, be born in. And the, and the parts that had to be broken and discarded were broken and discarded. So, um, go for it sometimes I say you know some if, if we we came here to fail actually in some ways mm -hmm. and until and, and then the true character comes from what do we do after we failed and have lost what we thought was most precious who do we turn to then do we curse God and die or do we say thy will be done and blessed be the name of the Lord God great point thanks I have a no. thought, Brent. Um, Go for it. We have, we have inherited the idea that God is all-knowing, all-present, and all-something else from the Catholics. And uh, I have, over the course of my life, I have uh, taken this superlative God who pins the scale on every um, virtue and every capacity. And I have come to understand him in a more limited way. He is all-knowing, which now means to me that he knows everything that can be known. He is all powerful, but that means only that he has all power that one can have. Um, and so when the gods say, uh, we will prove them herewith to see if they will do whatsoever thing um, we command them, got that slightly wrong. I'm willing to consider that they have to see. They, the gods don't know the future. They don't have a crystal ball. Uh, they do actually, but um, I, I think we have to go through the process. One of the things that sometimes really ticks me off is when my mo wife condemns me for things that she knows I'm going to say, but I didn't yet say them. And I'd like to be judged on what I do and what I say, not what somebody's sure I'm going to do or going to say. Good point. Hey, Donald Danner, I haven't heard from you. Any thoughts? I saw you posted something in the chat. You're muted. OK. 
okay, now I'm unmuted with the help of my daughter. Okay. I was typing some comments that one of the hard things for me was letting go of that Del Parsons painting. Uh, and I thought, well, for heaven's sakes, President Campbell told us that was, was how the Lord was close to looking. And after the parable, when I read the parable early, I thought, well, I don't think that's right. Uh, and I don't think that particular painting is effeminate or anything, but it just doesn't fit. And I, you know, I've read and know what Denver said about it. The, the painting is, the, you know, if you know what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. I also wondered in the, the parable who the princes were, I had some sense of who they might be, but I thought, well, isn't that interesting that there were princes who challenged, uh, the princes of Shiloh who challenged uh, Axis. And, and yet they, they soon learned that that, that was, was not getting them anywhere. They, they, they could uh, prevail in that kind of a competition. So those were some of the thoughts that I had was, I thought about that Del Parsons painting and letting go of that. And I thought, oh my gosh, that's, that's like my own personal idol, I guess. And, and then who the princes were and, uh, and continuing along the path uh, for each of us to develop a personal relationship with the Lord. And I felt like the parable uh, made it more real. And I forget who mentioned it, that there were terms mentioned, like he was tall, uh, mm -hmm. scarred, and so forth. It made more sense to me and uh, how, I, how I see the, the, the Savior. Okay, now how do I mute myself? You just sit there very quietly. Just good. Uh, Jared, you had your hand up. Yeah, so I guess if I can comment completely my opinion, if anyone cares for it, if not, you can mute me. Uh, it's, I, I guess, another paradigm shift issue. I guess growing up and being kind of inundated with the idea that you were completely awesome and faithful in the pre-existence and just a all, all around outstanding being. And now you're experiencing this kind of thing. Like that one, I guess I've really had to question more. And now I'm to be more frank, I'm not sure I'm not almost exactly perhaps the opposite. It seems perhaps more believable to me that I was probably closer to betraying Christ before and not being some awesome being. And that, because, I mean, if we're on a probationary state, I mean, you don't usually take someone who's been totally faithful and great and say, for you to progress, I'm going to put you on probation. I mean, it seems like it's more if you've been a terrible person, but you've maybe showed that you have some inclination that you might do a little bit better. Maybe you improve to be put on probation. I mean, speaking of the fall, like if the devil is miserable in the sense of being spiritually and I presume physically dead, being separated, dead in the full and final sense of that word, the condition that we're in is barely a step away from that. And it's only because Christ is willing to make his sacrifice that keeps us from being subject to the devil and being likened to him and being angels to devils ourselves. I mean, we're one step away from falling into that same pit that he's in. And I guess in that sense, being tested or proven isn't to say that we're great and wonderful but it's like hey maybe we can show that we have some capability and want to do a bit better than what we've been proved for a really long time and maybe it's a blessing that we don't remember what we were like before because it was really horrible and it's better that we uh, just forget that and see if a clean slate will help us pick up from being that kind of person jared how does the Lord, having gone through all of this before us, inform your 
opinion about that, about that sinking suspicion that we're all probably not as good as we think, as strong as we think, as pretty as we think, or whatever. How does the Lord doing it first inform your opinion? Mm. Am I supposed to respond? <laughs> I'm not really sure. To if be you honest. will. Well, I, I guess in, in my, how I see things now, my current and allow me to change perspective kind of thing is that I'm not sure all of the steps that it took for him to get to where he is at the point that he he's at. But I guess for me, it, I now see that goal where before it was like, oh, I'm just a hop, skip, and a jump away, and I'm right there. It's more like what I see now is much like it's almost an almost incomprehensible gulf. Like I'm not sure. I don't. I mean, I think I could get there, but it's a it's a huge gulf. I guess it's my current like view on it. So it's how he got to where he is. I guess I can trust, and I, there's some faith that I can become like that. But I don't see that being like, oh, it's a simple hop, skip, and it'll be it'll be there. Can I make a statement on that? I, a story that's been really prevalent in, in my life lately was, you know, the story of the brother Jared. And um, I'll try to condense this really quick, but we all know in the story that the brother Jared takes the 16 stones before the Lord and goes through the process of the, the Lord touching each of those, those stones. And then finally on the, on the last stone is where the brother of Jared's faith is so sharpened that he sees the, the finger of the Lord. Um, something that hit me like a ton of bricks recently is that it was on the 16th stone that the brother of Jared saw the Lord, but the Lord was in Jared, the brother of Jared's presence the whole time. It was the brother of Jared who failed to see the Lord. And it kind of made me realize that I, I firmly believe that every single one of us could share an experience of when we know without a doubt in my mind, our, our minds that we were in the Lord's presence, that he was, he was right there beside us. And that, that's what I've, I've realized through all of this. The Lord is not some distant God. He's not a guy that just sits out there in outer space and watches from a distance. He is ever present in our, in our lives. And the, that's why when people see, see the Lord, um, the accounts that I've studied out, that I've seen, often his hands come into focus for. One thing I've learned about that is how his hands symbolize the invitation to come unto him. He's inviting. He's there. He's saying, come and see me. Come, come and accept that. So to me, this whole, this whole thing can be summed up by just saying that, that like, it is our responsibility to accept that invitation. It is our responsibility to acknowledge that we are in his presence at times and that he is there with us. And like, it doesn't matter. Like, man, I have made mistake after mistake still for some reason he's there i don't understand why but he is and i love that about it appreciate that samantha corbridge since you're on camera share with us what you had uh, posted in the in the chat and any other thoughts you've got um i just have been having the thought about war horses were um I mentioned this to Brian. Uh, war horses were meant were called to be said to be meeked um, when they were ready to go to war. And so, when a horse is meeked, that horse is very, very clear in his own power. He knows exactly what his power is, how powerful he is. He knows the power and where it comes from, and he's so finely tuned to um, his master that is riding him that he can respond to the slightest 
nudge or message from his master and he can go forward in his full power um, at the touch of his master's hand. And so I just, that just kind of brought to my mind um, the war horse and the being meeked and how that's a great kingly um, quality to have. Samantha? Yeah. That also brings to mind the notion in the church of being church broke. That is, you bend the will of otherwise bright, intelligent men and women to do whatever the church party line is, to follow their guidelines and principles and imaginations. Unfortunately, that was misused. I really think we ought to be meek to our Lord only, our God only. I think that's the uh, satanic imitation of the real thing. All right. Well, on that note, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, I don't have anything else. Uh, I have a couple of closing comments. Um, does anybody else have anything they'd like to add, Tasha? Um, I'm going to add just a few things that I want Adrian to talk about Shiloh just for a minute. Um, what it is, where it is, the significance of it. Um, the first three paragraphs in the parable, I think, are really descriptive um, of the Lord. It's kind of setting the stage for the whole parable. Um, and these are just some of my thoughts on what some of these things may mean. But it says that the horses of Shiloh were renowned, or Shiloh, were renowned, renowned in all the world for their strength and speed. In every competition, it was the horses of Shiloh which won the test. So um, I was trying to think, who are these horses of Shiloh? Because it's, we're not just focusing on the one right now. It, it's the horses, and these are the strongest. Um, it says in every competition. So kind of reminded me of Parable 9, the great competition. Um, it was the horses of Shiloh which won the test. So these horses, I know that some people come here to prove, some here are um, here to be proven. It seems like these horses of Shiloh might be the ones who come here to prove. They're the strongest, um, maybe the ones who know the, math, the most. The Elohim. The Elohim. And then the next paragraph, the people of Shiloh let their horses run free when they were not used for labor. Um, this is where I wanted him to talk about Shiloh and what it means or could yeah. mean do that and then you notice in the end it talks about the horses were no longer free to roam and so on and so forth that kind of wraps up with that it's kind of interesting go ahead adrian so when the when the israelites came in and possessed the land of canaan the promised land shiloh is in the mountains of ephraim and it's where they set up their tabernacle so the tabernacle that had gone with them in the wilderness and they carried for 40 years and so on they set it up there permanently at shiloh and that was the center of Israelite worship. And the presence of God was there. The Shekinah, it was called. The, this is where Samuel saw the Lord face to face. And um, as, as a young child, oddly. And um, so the, the idea that that was perhaps a representation of true Israelite worship prior to it being corrupted. This is prior to them ever building a temple, prior to them removing the Ark of the Covenant from the tabernacle and taking it to the temple in Jerusalem that, uh, that David chose and, and Solomon built. So there's something very ancient about using that name, Shiloh, uh, because it predates everything that came along to corrupt, um, including things you might identify, elements you might identify, later Christianity, Catholicism, and so on from this story. Um, originally, the horses of Shiloh were renowned in all the world, just as the God of Israel 
as of right now. Down in all the world. So. The, the people of Shiloh, I'm wondering if that could be representative then of, of the house of Israel, the people of Israel, where the horses were maybe the Elohim. Um, and then it goes on to talk about the great horse that was born in the wilds of Shiloh. Uh, the Lord wasn't born in Jerusalem, in their city. And um, and he came from Nazareth. Right. Out he came times. out from the wilds. Um, and then, let's see, and then at the end of the third paragraph, by the time the people of Shiloh brought him into their city, now I think we're talking about Jerusalem. Right. The, the children of Israel, now corrupt, but brought him into the city, which was Jerusalem, and they named him Axis, um, or his warlike mm -hmm. appearance. Anyway, I just thought those were some interesting things to think about. Those are good points, and like I said when we started, there's more to this than than what I kind of zeroed in on, but it's it's worth the time and the study. Um, Daryl Skousen, you have some comments. Would you share them with us? Sure. I was just, when Natasha was talking about the strength of the horses, I mean, talk, at the beginning, he has to talk about how, the, how they had their strength, and then towards the end, it also mentions that they no longer competed in the competitions of strength, but it made me think of Again, the section in Doctrine and Covenants, where Joseph is asking specifically about Isaiah, Isaiah and what it meant to put on the strength, put on the strength of Zion, and how God described that as the people in the last day that would be called by God to put on the strength, which is the authority of the priesthood. And um, so, just the strength being that authority. I think Denver also, in one of his podcasts on ordinances, said. Uh, for two years, I have watched, attended some of your meetings, gathered reports, and tried to let you stand and display your strength and understanding. So I think, again, I think that was kind of what he was getting at, is that we have this chance and this responsibility to become like those early horses, right? Those horses of Shiloh who were known for their great strength. Excellent. Thank you. Brent, Brent, can I squeeze, squeeze in one more? Kevin, sorry. Nope. Um, I guess when I was just sitting here thinking about the overall theme, it really comes to mind the, the concept that we make God in our own image, right? The way that we want to perceive God. And so um, whether, you know, I think that the contentment from the very first parable when, when they... Um, he talks at the very end where there was a time when he would have had questions, but he's just content just being there with the Lord. I think that's, I think when I, I can, I mix the two together and I say, we would be content to have whatever image of the Lord is the truth, right? And that mankind can whirl and mix and paint any picture the way that they want to have their God be, but we need to be content with, with the reality of the scars and um, not make him in our image, but that we should make ourselves in him, his image. Kevin, did you have something to say? Yeah, in response to your first question, one of the profound insights, one of the startling paradigm shifts for me in studying the words of Denver is the notion that right next to every male axis figure is a female axis figure. These two have come through eons of cycles. They've gone through every conceivable test and battle and they're still motivated by love. They're still motivated by the path of the holy order. And that thrills me. Thanks for sharing that. You know, I want to, the lamb, one last thing about the lamb and the lion. Um, you know, I, I like that comment too about the, because we're talking a lot about um, uh, the image of God and Christ and, and kind of his maleness, but I think we lose both 
the reality of who God is, the strength of his maleness and, and also the power of, of the other side of that equation. Uh, when we kind of make it too soft, <laughs> you know, on both sides, I think lawyer was talking about that earlier. Um, Cause like my wife, I mean, I see much power in her and love and I see meekness, but she also has at times have had, had to, I've seen the lion and that lion is what I needed at certain times. And, uh, and I think sometimes in our relationships, we need the lamb. Some, sometimes we're the lamb with each other. Sometimes we're the lion, need to be the lion and awake each other. And it's, it's kind of a, a tough thing to figure out the balance there. Um, but I'm, I'm grateful for that part of my wife that is that godly part that also reminds me, not so gently, <laughs> okay, very rarely, but occasionally she's had to hit me pretty hard <laughs> and remind me this is not, you know, the lion is what was needed. So I think, um, anyway, I, we shouldn't be afraid of either side. And and all that you know male female and power and meekness and everything so thanks appreciate it is there anything else anybody would like to add if not in closing i've got a couple of thoughts i want to share the truth will prevail no matter who fights against it it will prevail i will stand with truth and against all who oppose it either high or low, inside or outside the church. The truth matters. Men and institutions do not. And put an end to your idolatry and look to Christ. Read James 1, 5 through 6 and Moroni 10, 5. That is where you should invest your time, not in trivia involving me, Denver, or some other man. The time is upon us. The heavens are open. Not for someone other than you, not for some special leader. They are open for you, for all of us. Stop looking around, look up. That is where you will find not only a testimony of God, but God's handiwork on display. So that's all I have. Appreciate your time. Appreciate the participation. It's been good. Take care. Thanks, Brent. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, thank you, Brent. Great stuff. You bet. Good night. Lisa, do you have any thoughts for us? Nope. Who said that? Kevin? Yep. Kevin? <laughs> you're this thing, all right? Now you're asking if I have any thoughts. I, I have some thoughts. So I'm really sleepy. <laughs> well it's later in the evening for you there my dear it is it is i'm i'm a little groggy i appreciate everybody's comments and and yeah i i agree with what tasha said about um about the horses being the servants and um definitely uh servants get scarred up i mean it's not an easy it's not an easy path um but like you said, it's a worthwhile path and it's all motivated by love. If that's, that helps you, then have a good night. And I appreciate seeing everybody. Yeah, I appreciated especially the, the comments here at the end about um, how we need to uh, maybe reconsider or recalibrate our idea of perfection. What, uh, what we look to or what we consider as perfection, either male or female, uh, really is probably inaccurate and we need to recalibrate what perfection actually is and how there's probably components of both that uh, all of us need to acquire uh, in some way. Anyway, Brent, thank you very much for the discussion. I, uh, I really enjoyed this and thought it went wonderfully well. Appreciate your preparation and appreciate everybody else for joining in and participating. It was a uh, wonderful time as usual and uh, really looking forward to next week. Next week is the tree i think my wife is going to be doing that one it's going to be wonderful right. looking forward very to good it. uh thanks everybody again i'm signing off have a good great night thanks everybody see you